invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, we'll be looking at verses 25 through 37 today. And as you turn there, you may have noticed already in our worship guide, we're going to be beginning, be beginning our second service with a baptism as we're celebrating uh, the baptism of Charlie Keene. And so we do invite you after Sunday school to come in and be a part of the beginning of our second worship service so that you can uh, fellowship and celebrate with us in her baptism. Well, we're coming again today to Luke chapter 10. If you've been with us as we've walked through Luke's gospel, you know that uh, we're at a point now where Jesus uh, has not only commissioned the, the 12 apostles, but uh, now he has sent out 72 disciples, other followers of his, to go out and proclaim uh, the gospel of the kingdom to all these surrounding villages and places that Jesus then is going to go and proclaim the gospel himself. And now what we've seen is those 72 have returned and they are rejoicing. Uh, they are rejoicing specifically because uh, as they tell Jesus, they've seen uh, the demons respond to them in the authority of Jesus Christ that he has given them. And they are praising God for this, for this kingdom work that they've seen taking place. And if you were with us as we looked at this passage, you know uh, that Jesus, uh, he celebrates that, but he reminds them uh, that not just to celebrate that, but to, to celebrate something even greater. That, that the greatest rejoicing we have as followers of Jesus Christ is that we can rejoice that our names are written in heaven. That we can rejoice that we indeed have eternal life. Well, you can imagine as Jesus says something like this to the 72, uh, that there would be others, as at this point in Jesus' ministry, he's always surrounded by crowds. There's always many people there uh, wanting to hear from him, some wanting to learn from him, and as we've already seen, uh, some who are trying to catch him saying the wrong thing. And we've already seen the religious community uh, reject Jesus, and many of them will try to question him, and so uh, that all then comes into today's passage where uh, you have someone, uh, an expert in the law, who's going to ask Jesus a question about the very thing that he just talked to the 72 about. Celebrate, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Celebrate that you have eternal life. Then the question comes, well, how then can we have eternal life? And we'll pick up there in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25, and at a reference, for God's word, if you're able, I want to invite you to stand as I read this passage for us. And this is what the word of God says. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, well, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. 
Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. If you would pray with me. Father, as we come to a very familiar passage, or, or at least a, a familiar story to us, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, it is tempting for us to walk away from this passage with a goal to do better, with a goal to, to show more mercy and show more kindness to those in need. And while these are virtuous things, these are not saving things. None of us will stand before you and your kingdom pleading our works, pleading our deeds in order to have access to eternal life. We may only plead the blood of Christ. So, Father, help us then to see how we might understand this passage in light of the gospel truth that we have before us, that all we truly have is Jesus, and help our hope to be in him. As we consider this word now, we ask this in his name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we come now to the parable of the Good Samaritan, even though this parable is unique to Luke's gospel, it is likely one of the best-known parables in the Bible. Most people have heard, at least, of the Good Samaritan. Most people, uh, even among the most biblically illiterate, could probably give you some idea of what it means to be a good Samaritan. In fact, in our culture, in our context, just about every state in our country has some sort of law on the books entitled a Good Samaritan Law. Uh, you can find Good Samaritan assisted living facilities. You can find Good Samaritan hospitals like the one we have just up the road in Lexington, Kentucky. And all of these things and all of these laws, they come from this concept and this idea that to be a good Samaritan is a, a virtuous pursuit. It is a moral cause. It is a good thing to love others, specifically those in need, those who are hurting, those who are suffering. You should be compassionate on them. And that's why this term Good Samaritan is so well known because even in the darkest times in our world today, even in the darkest places, even among places where wickedness and evil thrive, that there is this idea that we, we need this virtue, we need this morality, we, we need people who will be our good Samaritans. And yet, as followers of Christ, we need to pause and consider why does Jesus tell this story? What is the point of the parable of the Good Samaritan? Because if we don't consider it in the context in which Luke delivers it to us, we can easily walk away with the wrong application of this parable. And so what I hope we can do today is perhaps take a fresh look for many of you at this parable that is so well known, but I believe so often misunderstood. Because so often we take it out of the context in which Jesus presents it. And the context, again, is eternal life. The context is a question that comes up, and not a good faith question, but a question in order to test Jesus. A question from an expert in the law who is seeking to catch Jesus contradicting himself, who is hoping that he might bring evidence related to Jesus that condemns him. And the question is a good question. <laughs> Even though the context and the heart from which it comes is not good, it's a good question. It's a question that others were asking in Jesus' day. It's a question that we should all be asking in our day. How can we inherit eternal life? And so that's where we're going to begin in our study today. And I've summarized the question as point one there in your outline. How can we be saved? How can we be saved from sin? How can we be saved 
from the wrath of God? How is it that we might stand in the presence of, an, of a holy God when the scripture is clear that we are unholy people? That all have sinned and indeed fallen short of the glory of God. How is it that we might one day come into his kingdom? Well, let's consider that as we now come back to this parable, beginning again with verse 25. A lawyer who stands up to put Jesus to the test. Now, this is not a lawyer uh, in terms of what probably comes to your mind and my mind when we think about lawyers today. When we think about lawyers today, we think about people whose profession is the law. This is their career. This is their job. But the, the law being referred to here is the law of Moses. It's the Mosaic law. It's the law of God. It's, it's the Hebrew Bible. It's our Old Testament. And what we have here in this lawyer is an expert in the Mosaic law. This is someone who spent and dedicated their life to studying the Mosaic law in order that they might be able to understand it and in order that they might think that they could follow it. And this expert then in the law is seeking, as I've already mentioned, to test Jesus. And so it's not a, a good faith question, although it is a good question. But what we see here and what we've seen already in Luke's gospel is that this expert in the law is wanting to condemn Jesus. If you've been with us in our study of Luke's gospel, you know that already we've seen that this cause among Pharisees and among scribes and now here among lawyers, experts in the law, they, they want to condemn Jesus. You may recall back when we were in Luke chapter 6 when Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath. This was a, a great offense to the religious community. And so from that point forward, what we see is that they, according to Matthew's gospel, they want to destroy Jesus. And so there's a concerted effort. There, there is an organized cause here. They're, they're wanting to record what he says, when he says it, who he says it to, that they're wanting to put questions before him, kind of leading questions that might catch him in contradicting himself, or better yet, contradicting the law of Moses. So that then, as we will see in Luke's gospel, when they bring him before the council, when they bring him before the leaders, they can say, well, well here's the reasons. Here's what he's done wrong. Here's what condemns him, his own words. And so it's in that context then that we see this expert in the law asks this question, which again, it's not a good faith question, but it's a good question. And it's not unique to this expert in law. Uh, this is the question that we will see when we eventually get to Luke chapter 18. When we see the rich young ruler who comes before Jesus and essentially asks the exact same question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is the question that will be asked repeatedly in the book of Acts. We come to Acts chapter 2. Peter preaches at Pentecost and he tells those gathered that they are indeed sinners, that they are indeed wicked men, that it is because of them that Jesus went and died on the cross. And they are so convicted by what Peter preaches. They are convicted by their sin. They recognize their need for salvation, and they cry out, what do we need to do to be saved? It's a question that resonates with us today. It is a question on the hearts of men and women and children around the globe today. It is a question on many of your hearts today. What must you do to be saved? And by God's grace, it is a question that he not only puts before us, but I believe leads us directly to the answer in this parable. Although he does it a bit less direct than we might think he would. And you think about the ministry of Jesus up until this point. You think about the ministry that will come. You think about what Peter says in the book of Acts 2. When the people ask him, what must we do to be saved? What does Peter say? Repent. <laughs> Turn from your sin. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Be baptized, every one of you. Someone comes today and says to me, Pastor, what do I need to do to be saved? I would say that same thing. Well, first, you need to repent. You need to return from your sin. You need to put your trust in Jesus as Lord. This is 
the gospel we preach. Romans chapter 10. If any will confess Jesus as Lord and believe in their hearts that God raised him from the dead, they will be saved. This is how you might have eternal life. And yet Jesus' answer isn't quite that direct, is it? I mean, in light of what we know of the gospel, when this question comes before Jesus, this question that's asked most likely in front of many people, we might expect Jesus to say, well, that's an excellent question. Let me tell you right now about the order of salvation. Now, let me explain to you what it means to confess me as Lord. Let me explain to you what it means to truly repent. Let me explain to you what it means to be justified by faith and faith alone and me and in me alone by the grace of God and God alone. We might expect that type of answer. And yet that's not exactly how Jesus answers. He answers, though, in a way that I believe will, will lead this expert in the law, a way that might lead others to recognize something that at this point they were not recognizing. Which brings us to that second point before you. Number two, they needed and we need to recognize that the law cannot save us. The law cannot save us. And so, in response to the lawyer's question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life, rather than go through that order of salvation and those things that we might, see, that we might say and that Peter says in Acts chapter 2, notice Jesus answers a question with a question. Now, to some of you, that might be a very frustrating thing at times. In fact, some of you who are children this morning or who have ever been a child this morning, Probably had that experience where you went to your mother or your father, and I can just say from my experience, probably your father, and you asked a question, and he answered your question with a question. And he did it in a way that may have given the appearance of great wisdom and understanding. And as a father, I'm going to tell you this morning, sometimes the reason we do that is because we don't know the answer. I remember specifically my father often when I was a kid, and you know, if you're young, this won't make any sense, uh, but in our day it did. We would ask parents how to spell things. We did not have that little item. We didn't have Google and Siri and Alexa to just ask. We had our parents and our fathers, and I would often ask my father, Dad, how do you spell? Anybody want to guess what my dad would say? Look it up. He would essentially not say, I don't know how to spell it. He would say, look it up. And so I saw that then as an exercise in me learning. Now I realize he didn't know how to spell it either. And I don't know how to spell a lot of things. And so I just say, Siri or Google or Alexa, look it up. That's not, though, why Jesus does this. <laughs> Jesus doesn't answer a question with a question because Somehow he doesn't know the answer, or somehow he, he, he's doing something to twist this around. He, he is asking a question in reference to a question, because the question he asked points directly to the question he's been asked. And he's trying to help this lawyer, he's trying to help those listeners, he's trying to help us today to understand what the answer to this question truly is. How might we inter uh, inherit eternal life? And Jesus, in his question, he answers the question. Well, what's written in the law? Here, the law he's referring to is the law of Moses, the Mosaic law, the, the Hebrew Bible, the law that this expert was an expert in. What does the Word of God say? Now, don't miss what Jesus does here. He says the answer to the question, how might we inter uh, inherit eternal life? How might we be saved? The answer to this question is found in God's Word and God's Word alone. Don't miss that. Because we live in a culture today that when you bring up this concept, this question of, of what might we do to be saved, or it's more likely as how can we get to heaven, because so many don't recognize the need to be saved from anything, how might we get to whatever it is they may describe as this eternal life and this place of joy? And how, how might we get there? 
So often the answer that is given and the answer that is sought simply comes down to how we feel and what we think. Well, I just think, I mean, I can't tell you the number of conversations I've had about this very thing with people. Oftentimes in light of death and mourning and grieving and a loved one who's passed on, you know, the question, the conversation comes up about what happens when we die. I point towards the scripture and what the scripture teaches us about salvation through Christ and Christ alone, what Christ calls us to believe, what it means to repent and trust in him. And so often there, there's, there's something that wells up within so many and it's essentially this attempt of self-justification, as we'll see the lawyer do in this passage. And how it comes out is, well, yeah, I, I know that that's what a lot of Christians believe, but, but pastor, I just think, I just feel as if somehow that's going to be the source of all truth and understanding. And Jesus here, he points us directly to where the answer is found. What, what is written in the law? What is written in the Word of God? Because the Word of God tells us exactly what it takes to inherit eternal life. Exactly what it takes to spend eternity with Christ. But, but this is where you know, Jesus is leading this expert in the law. And so he says, what is written in the law and how do you read it? In other words, well, you're the expert here. <laughs> you, you spent your life studying the law. You're asking me this question. You clearly believe that you know the answer to it because he's trying to trick Jesus here. Jesus knows that. So what's written in the law and how do you read it? And so he tells him how he reads it. He answers him, verse 27. Well, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he's actually pulling from two different places in the Old Testament day, putting these things together. And, and in doing this, he's, he's summarizing the first and second table of the law, that the Ten Commandments. He, he's summarizing very clearly what the Old Testament teaches. The Ten Commandments, the first four, love God. The last six, love others, love your neighbor. And he is putting before Jesus a summation of so much of what the law teaches. You should love God. You should love your neighbor. Verse 28, Jesus says, that's right. Go do it. Now, think about this for a second. That The lawyer puts this question before Jesus. He's wanting to test Jesus. Hey, he's probably expecting an argument from Jesus. Jesus answers his question with a question about the law. How do you understand the law? He tells him how to understand the law. Jesus says, that's great. You got the answer right. Now go do it. You might think this would satisfy him. You might think at this point he'd say, oh, okay. Well, he agrees with me. Okay, he'd move on. But no, verse 29. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now we could spend this Lord's Day, next Lord's Day, and many Lord's Days. They're just talking about that one verse, that, that one phrase, desiring to justify himself. Because friends, that, that is the world we live in. That is the world that has always existed. That is the heart of man. We want to justify ourselves. And you see this, don't you? And you usually see it come out when someone confronts you on doing something wrong. You think about the last time you were confronted on anything. Maybe your spouse pulled you aside and said, hey, I, I'm not sure you caught this, but when, when you said, or when you did, maybe a parent pulls you aside, kids, and says, listen, you know, you, you, you did this, and this was wrong. And maybe somebody comes to you and they says, hey, listen, I, I, I heard this, or I was told this, and how do we respond in those situations? What, what is our natural response? 
I'm just going to take a wager this morning that that response from so many of us is not to say, thank you for pointing that out about me. I am so grateful that you have shown me how I was wrong. And man, I just, I am so thankful that you told me that. And I can't wait to change that about myself. Maybe some of you respond that way, but for most of us, we get defensive, don't we? Well, wait a second. Wait, no, you, you, you misunderstood that. Well, who, wait a second. Who are you to tell me? Let, let me tell you a few things about you. If we're going to get into the exchange here of confronting one another. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because I actually have a list tucked away here. And let's see. 21 years ago at our wedding, you did this. And then the next day you did. And then we just get defensive. But, but what is that defensiveness? go back to it. It goes back to, we just want to justify ourselves. What we want to say, well, you don't understand because at the end of the day, I was right. Self-justification. And that's exactly what the lawyer does here. He, he wants to justify himself. Why? Because it's getting to his heart. Because Jesus says to him, well, what do you understand the law to say? And he summarizes correctly what the law of God says. You need to love God and love others. And Jesus says, now go do it. And then, wait a second here, wait. Let, let's clarify what you mean by that, Jesus. Because, I mean, I mean, nobody can actually love everybody this way. Now, nobody can really love God perfectly. The, the, the expert in the law knew this. He knew he wasn't perfectly righteous and holy, but rather than take that to a place of repentance and brokenness, where he and others would often take it, is into dissecting the law and dividing up the law so that they might feel justified in their actions. In fact, it was very common in this day for the keepers of the law, the experts in the law, the religious leaders to teach. Everybody's not your neighbor. Let's not get carried away here. And so, so first of all, I mean, obviously God is just talking about the people of God. So this is, this is only a commandment within the context of the Jewish people. But even within the Jewish people, we've got different levels and different classes and different people. So really, he's talking here about the people who are like me. I am an expert in the law. I am a, a righteous Jew. And so he's just telling me, I need to love these other people who are like me. I mean, that's who we're naturally inclined to love, isn't it? People like us. I mean, it's not so hard to love people who are lovable. But there are some other people that it's really hard to love, aren't there? There are some people we just avoid because the tendency of our heart is not this overwhelming love towards them. And I'm not saying, I'm not talking about like deep-seated hatred. I'm just saying little things come between us, differences of opinion, and then we get at odds or we're not like-minded, and then we just we start to build these things up in our mind. And then we just, well, it'd just be easier for me to stay over here with these people and have them stay over there with their people. And yeah, maybe on occasion we'll have to be together, but you know, I, I like to be around it. Why? Because I like to I like to love people who it's easier to love. It's very easy to love some of you. Some of you are miserable. I count myself among that. I'm not an easy person to love. Notice what Jesus does here. He doesn't say. You're right. Now, make sure you understand you just need to love the people that are lovable. When this keeper of the law seeks to justify himself and say, who is my neighbor? Now Jesus gets to the heart of the issue. Now remember the context. Eternal life, salvation, conversion. What, what, what is it that will allow me to be in the presence of a holy God? How might I inherit? I mean, the, the lawyer gets that right. <laughs> He's not going to earn it. He's not going to buy it. He's going to inherit it. It's going to be a gift of God. That's what God's Word teaches. 
And we're not there yet. You get to Ephesians 2, and what's God going to tell us? He's going to say, this is a gift of God. And we see that thread throughout the Scripture. This is a gift of God. You inherit it. He gets that part right. But how might you inherit it? Jesus says, by perfectly obeying what the law commands. Let's dissect that. <laughs> sure, I don't need to love everybody. I'll just love my neighbor. Who's my neighbor? That's the context for the parable of the Good Samaritan. And that helps us to see that at the end of the day, the point of the parable of the Good Samaritan is not go out and be a Good Samaritan. If that's what you walk away from this parable with, you, you've missed it. Because notice what Jesus is doing here. He's helping this man to see that in the most extreme of situations, the most unlikely of people he would ever interact with, that's your neighbor, everyone's your neighbor, go do this perfectly. So Jesus begins before the parable by saying, this is what the law commands, go do it. This man essentially debates Jesus. I want to justify myself. Let's dissect this a little bit. I want to feel more comfortable about what you're saying. Surely not everybody's my neighbor is what he could have said. But he phrases it, who is my neighbor? Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Again, we know this parable. I won't belabor this. But just to summarize, a man's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. He falls among robbers. Jesus says he's left half dead. He has nothing. He's beaten. He looks terrible. He's in a mess. He's going to die. What happens? A priest, and then he says a Levite. And now these are the people that the expert in the law would believe were his neighbors. These are the people like him. These are the keepers of the law. These are the keeper of God's commandments. These are the people that take care of the temple. They're, they're we. This is the group that he's in. He essentially could have said to the man, now let's just imagine you were walking down the road and here's what you would do. But sometimes it's easier to say, Let, let's talk about this other guy for a second. A priest, a Levite, they see the beaten man. Neither one of them does anything to help him. Both of these men, well-versed in the commands of God, both of these men would have fully recognized and understood the validity of, of the lawyer's answer to the question, both of these men likely would have given the very same answer, and both of these men, by the way, in this moment, would have believed they were doing what God said to do. Why? Because they did not see this man as their neighbor. So I don't need to help him because he's not my neighbor. I need to love God and love my neighbor. Who's my neighbor? Well, it's a short list, <laughs> but I'm loving him. Therefore, I am righteous, and I'll inherit eternal life. They know the law, but they don't practice it. Jesus says to this man, exhibit A, a priest, exhibit B, a Levite. They, they know the law, but they're not practicing it. But notice, Jesus doesn't just say, a priest and a Levite, they don't do this thing, they know the law, they don't practice it. Then he gives, out of all the examples he could give, likely the most offensive example of someone who would never even be associated with the law of God and how they indeed are doing what the law truly commands. A Samaritan, he says, has compassion. Now again, if you didn't know anything about Samaritans other than where we've come in Luke so far, you know that not long before this, as Jesus sends out the twelve into villages and cities and sends out others to go out into places that he's about to preach, they go into a Samaritan village. You may recall that when the Samaritans learn that Jesus' face is set towards Jerusalem, they don't even want him in their town. You may recall how James and John responded to that. Well, Jesus, we can go get some gasoline and some matches right now. We can burn that city down. Or better yet, what do they say? You want us to call fire down from heaven right now and consume them? Because they see the Samaritans. They, they associate the Samaritans with, with those situations in the Old Testament which are most wicked, most deserving of the wrath of God. There, there's no grace for them. There's no mercy for them. There's no compassion for them. Let's burn them to the ground right now. And now, 
of all the people that Jesus could choose, all the people groups he could pull from, he pulls from the Samaritans. And there's a long history we've already discussed between the Jews and the Samaritans and their hatred towards one another. One commentator I read this week summarized it very well. In the Jews' eyes, the Samaritan were compromising mongrels. That they wanted nothing to do with them. And so at this point in the parable, we would expect some audible gasps. We would expect some of the Jewish community, as they hear Jesus say, the priest didn't help him, the Levite didn't help him, but all of a sudden the Samaritan helps him, there would be people in that crowd who would turn their backs. That they would not even look on Jesus saying something like this. This was an offense. But Jesus uses this offensive case for a reason. In order that they might see an issue in their own hearts. And so that's where he brings the lawyer. You'll notice he brings him right back to the same place. He tells him this story. He says to him then, look, at the end of the parable, which one proved to be the neighbor? <laughs> you, you've asked the question, now answer your own question. Was it the priest who ignored him? Was it the Levite who ignored him? Or was it the Samaritan who at great personal expense did everything he could to help out this man in need? And even... This self-righteous keeper of the law understood the answer, the only answer he could give, and not just totally deceive others and deceive himself. And yet it would seem he couldn't even bring himself to say Samaritan, could he? <laughs> Which one of these proved to be a neighbor? Well, I, the one who showed him love. Not the, the one who showed him love. What does Jesus say? Okay, go do it. Do you see a theme here? What can I do to inherit eternal life? What does God's word say? Well, here's what the law says. And you keep the law. You're declared righteous by the law. The law is the standard of holiness. Okay, go do it. And there's a little problem there, Jesus. <laughs> I don't think anybody this morning wants to come up here, stand in this pulpit, and plead their holiness before us, apart from Christ. And tell us how perfect you've been, and how you've never sinned, and you've never run wrong, you've never had an impure thought, and all your deeds and intentions have always been perfect and righteous. And if, that, if you were to do that, then everyone would want to check your bag or your car and see what pills you're taking to make you have that delusional thought. What can I do to be saved? What can I do to inherit eternal life? What does the Bible say? The Bible says righteousness and holiness. Well, let's dissect that. No, do it. Well, what do you mean do it? Do it. Well, here's a story to help you see that you're not doing it. You think you're doing it. You think you're being righteous, but just look for a moment and understand. You know these things, but you do not do these things. Friends, that, that is so often, so often the commentary of our lives. So often that, that is the truth of our churches today. We know what the Bible teaches. But knowing isn't the same as doing. And we're not going to stand before God and take some type of Old and New Testament SAT. Where, okay, as long as you get this score, you can get in. Now, you get this score, you get a really nice place. But, you know, here, you know, this is entrance. The demand of God's law is perfect. Holiness and righteousness. And the problem is, God's word also tells us, there is none righteous, no, not one. So where's our hope? Or hope certainly not in our attempts to achieve these things on our own. And I think that's the point of the Good Samaritan parable. Because Jesus starts it by saying, what's the law say? Go do it! He ends the parable by saying, what's the law say? Go do it! 
you've read Pilgrim's Progress, as I've referred to it many times, this is where Bunyan would say, and the lawyer went away, and Christian saw him no more. <laughs> Nothing else about the lawyer. Jesus says, Jesus says to him, you go and you do likewise. That this would have been a great time for the lawyer to say, Jesus, I don't know what to do. I've studied the law, I know the law, and I can't achieve it. Where is hope for me, Jesus? And I pray that's where some of you are at right now. Maybe you have grown up thinking, if I can just do this, this level, if I can stay on this level of morality and virtue, and if I can just try hard, and I'll, you know, I'll go to church, and I'll, I'll go to Sunday school, and I'll, I'll do all these things, and I'll read my Bible, and I'll pray, and, and if I can just stay at this level, and yet the more you attempt that, the more you realize that that's not sufficient to save you. And you lay there in your bed at night, and, and through your mind, flood. All of these things, you think, my goodness, why did I, I said I wouldn't do that and I did it again. And then what we're tempted to do, I believe what the keeper of the law here was tempted to do, is then we just kind of go right back into justifying ourselves. Well, you know, that, here's why I did that and I'm so much better than so many other people and surely there's some hope for me because if there's not hope for me, there's not hope for anybody I believe the point of the parable, the point of what Jesus is saying here, is the law is not going to save you. But, point three, Jesus came. <laughs> and that's the sad irony of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Is that this keeper of the law is asking the question to the answer to the question. He's right there. What might I do to have eternal life? Trust in Jesus. But he just wants to debate him. And when he finds his answer is unsatisfactory, all indications are, this is where he departs and we see him no more. Friends, don't let that be your commentary. Understand and recognize this morning that God's standard is holiness. Perfect love for God, and you don't perfectly love God. But there's one who did, and there's one who does, and his name is Jesus. God's standard of righteousness and holiness is perfect love for others, perfect love for your neighbor. And who is your neighbor? Everyone's your neighbor. And friends, you and I fall short of that, don't we? But Jesus doesn't. In fact, he loved his neighbor so much that at this point he is heading towards the cross to die for their and our sin. You will never achieve this perfect standard of righteousness. And you don't need to because Christ already has. And that is why the call of the gospel today is not go and be a good Samaritan. The call of the gospel is put your trust in Jesus. The call is not go be perfect, it's trust in the one who is perfect. And then, in light of the gospel, and with a heart changed by the gospel, then you are fueled and empowered by the Holy Spirit to do what? To go and love God and love others. Your faith produces that kind of work. But don't get the order confused. Your works will never produce that kind of faith. First comes saving faith, and saving faith comes by putting our trust in Jesus. And friends, all we have is Jesus. And so I hope your trust and my trust will rest in him today. If you would stand as I pray to that end for us.